right, so good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you all here. My name's Eduardo and uh, I'm with Meta. I'm going to talk to you about putting the AR puzzle together with OpenStreetMap. Uh, I'm a program man manager at Meta working a lot, um, kind of on the intersection of our open data efforts with community. And I hope you find this interesting. <clears throat> AR is coming. That's the message I want you to leave uh, with today. I don't know when it's going to happen, whether it's going to come soon, whether it's going to take a long time. We do know it's hard. And I think it's very analogous to the, the self-driving kind of trend over the last 20 years. We've known it's possible to have self-driving cars, but it's incredibly <laughs> difficult to do. And it's taking longer than we thought. It's probably one of those things that happens slowly and then all at once. But I think it's incredibly exciting when you start to think about what could be possible with AR is more integrated in our everyday life. And that's kind of what I want to go through today. What that what does that look like and what does it mean for maps? I think most people know, but just to lay the groundwork, uh, AR is augmented reality, and it just means overlaying digital information over the real world. So unlike virtual reality, where you're kind of in a completely different space. AR is allowing us to continue interacting with the world around us, but to add digital information that we might otherwise have gotten from our phone or, or other places. Like many technologies, they, they kind of go through these hype cycles. Uh, 2021 was a very famous hype cycle. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? 2021 tech hype, hype cycles? Web3, crypto. That, that's not doing so well. I'm not going to guess at the future. I'm not going to say it's down and out. It's not going through a good time. And some people might rightly ask, AR going to go through the same thing? Has it gone through the same thing? Um, I would say no. I, I really am optimistic about the future of a technology like AR, and that's what we're getting into. So go back to ancient history. Just came to university, had my first smartphone, the, the kind of 3GS iPhone barely had any data, but when I did have data, I would use this app called Urban Spoon. Uh, hands up if you've used it in the past. A few people. It was really good in Melbourne where I was from. Um, you kind of set your location, the food that you wanted, and then the price, and it was like a slot machine. It was really fun. You, you kind of, sh or you could shake it or press the button and it would give you like what's around. But also had this like AR viewfinder, which would just use the compass and the location. And I guess the Latin one is the point of interest. And it was really useful for someone new to a student, um, to Melbourne as a student, to work out what was around me. Used it a lot, and it's probably the most I've used AR ever. But now we come to today, like AR is around. I think most of us have probably used it, but it's not ubiquitous in our day to day life, at least for the most of the people that I know. Shopping is one example where it's, it's pretty cool. I've measured a desk to see where, like, what it would look like in my house. Could use it for buying shoes now, I think, on some websites. Um, and just you know, furniture and things like that. But it, it's not it's not everywhere, it's not super common just yet. Face filters, um, in the name of like OSM, like that's the Snapchat's filters, and they're, they're really impressive actually. Amazing, like all the technology that's gone into this, but it's not it's not super useful for, uh, for anything other than like entertainment and communicating with people. But really cool what you can do with AR and filters. Gaming, of course, is probably one of the use cases that has really taken off. Pokemon Go was all the rage and used uh, a technology called um, VPS, like the visual positioning system, and obviously a lot of OSM data, which is kind of a joke in the OSM community as well, um, but they use a lot of OSM data. Paradox, which is a new one from Niantic, which very impressively, if you're on iPhone, you can test with just like maps out your room and you can throw a ball to this useless little animal. <laughs> but the one I think most of us are excited about is the navigation piece. And Google is doing some really cool stuff here. They're using Street View to be able to help you locate. And so rather than going down and looking at a 2 d map, you can hold your phone up, uses its like reference of Street View that it already has. Uh, works out where you are and gives you directions about where to go next. Really helpful if you're a pedestrian in a place like New York, but it hasn't scaled out to, to many places. It relies on, on Street View, um, uh, which is not everywhere. And obviously, Street View takes a, a lot to update, but I think it's really exciting and, and a kind of look at where it's going. 
And then we can start to think about like the potential of this. Uh, an obvious one is like you're waiting for an Uber. This is a, a situation where you're already using digital information a lot. And my experience at Richmond the other day, I came in late at night, kept looking down at my phone to, to work out where I was, um, and not where I was, where the Uber was. And like you, you should have been pretty close, but you know how it happens with Uber. It says it's a minute away, but like it's actually 10 minutes away. And so you keep looking up, down at your phone, looking up again. I think that's an example where AI would be really good. Where's the driver? Maybe the driver can see where I am. Um, the same could be said of a bus or, or a train, like just knowing where it is without having, having to distract yourself too much from um, your environment. Navigating by bicycle, like I think most of us have probably tried reading a map as we ride a bike, super dangerous, but sometimes that's what you got to do or you stop by the side of the road and are late to wherever you're going. Uh, understanding the history behind the Roman Forum, wouldn't that be cool if you're like at the Roman Forum and you, rather than using the government app, it's kind of clunky and trying to work out, okay, I'm looking at building 13, what was that 2,000 years ago? If you could just um, see an overlay on the real world, that would be a really immersive experience. It teaches you a lot about the area you're in without taking away from uh, the, the incredible place that you're in. And then navigation on foot, like pedestrian navigation, something uh, that really gets me excited and we'll talk about. It gets kind of weird when you start looking at AR and AR windshields. So this is the BMW panoramic vision that they're working on, apparently released, going to be released in two years. It's uh, kind of like a heads up display, which we've seen, but far bigger, far more immersive. They're starting to overlay. Um, information about like where you need to go next uh, and can actually start to do it um, and, and kind of match it to the physical world as well rather than just uh, kind of a, an overlay and the heads up display. And there's other companies working on this as well. Volvo is working on a Harman. And so we'll probably get to a strange time where they, we kind of know where the road is turning next. We know the speed limit because we have all this data. We're either getting it on the fly with the vehicle sensors. Or we just have I've collected it um, already thanks to companies like TomTom. So we're going to be in this weird stage where the car can almost drive itself, but right? you're overlaying the information in a very immersive way to the human. And then the car will probably start to drive itself. So what do you do with the windshield? Well, they're already looking, companies that like Harman are looking at, should we just turn this into like an entertainment screen where everything around you is like TVs? Um, can you show parts of the real world while you're in the car just as a passenger and you have conference calls in there. Um, it gets pretty weird and kind of Jetsons style when you think about what the future could be like for us in vehicles in 20, 30 years. Who knows when it would come. Why does any of this matter for OpenStreetMap? Well, as the famous Abraham Lincoln quote says, if the map falls in the forest, in the forest is it still a map? Um, you said this, I think, sometime around the, the time of the Civil War. Um, does anyone know the answer to this question? Yes. Yeah, of course it's still a map. It's a really stupid question. Um, <laughs> but if no one is using it, if, if it's like lost in the forest somewhere, it's, not, it's the point of having the map. And I think through street map, the great thing is like it started just around this incredible time, 2004, where the smartphones, as we know them today, came along shortly after. And, and OSM has powered so many of the mobile experiences that we didn't even think about. You know, whole companies have created, whole, whole services have been built around mobile uh, maps, and OSM has powered a lot of them. And I use them, like, as I said, exploring Melbourne when I didn't have much data. OSM was, was really critical. I was talking to Tim. I don't know if he's in the audience, but he was telling me he didn't have much data, and so he downloaded OSM, OSM and that's how he got into, into OpenStreetMap. So OpenStreetMap has been very useful. Can it be useful for like the next um, wave of computing, which I think a big part of it will be AR. So what map data do we need for this? There's a bit of a like few puzzle pieces here. Um, we've got all sorts of things that we'll, we'll need to make this happen. And that's what makes it hard. Just like self-driving cars or a lot of edge cases. Do you focus on a particular geographic area and get a lot of good data there, but then your technology won't work so well in other locations? But I think if we're thinking about pedestrian navigation, I told you I was very excited about that. Uh, we want to know where are the pedestrian ways, as a lot of people have been talking about often in OpenStreetMap, we know that it's on either side of the road, but we don't necessarily have the, 
the um, the line string of where the actual sidewalk is. So it's good to see people starting to map that. That's pretty critical. What about the uh, the crossings? We need to connect those to separate line strings. Um, and the more information we have about the crossing, the more the, the more helpful that is. Um, there was a talk from Mapbox earlier about like all the costing that you do for the car routing, and you can start to do the same for pedestrian routing, of course. Is it a zebra crossing where pedestrians have right of way, or is it a um, a traffic light where the cars are king? And then points of interest. If you don't know where you're going, uh, you don't have a point to go to. It's it's not that useful. And points of interest are always hard for for any map database. Keeping them up to date is an incredible challenge. So that's the essential stuff. Then there's the nice to have. We have three d buildings here, which uh, Linda and Eric are going to talk about on Sunday at 10.30. This is an overture data set that was recently released, and that helps you with AR if you want to like obscure something. Maybe there's something you want to place, uh, digital information you want to place, but you, you don't want it to be visible. Um, you could say, know where that building is because you've got the data set and obscure it. Um, you could do a bunch of other things too, place content in buildings. Um, Gradient, you know, how steep is, is the area, street lights, the safety, street name, um, allowed access, you know, can a pedestrian go there, can cars go there, wheelchair accessibility, tactile paving for the uh, mobility, um, the vision impaired, public transport locations, vegetation, is it a nice walk or is it a, is it a, uh, like by the side of a highway that might affect, you know, which route you want to take. And more abstract information, the reviews that I was using back in 2010 with Urban Spoon. And then we come to BPS. How do I know where I am? GPS has only taken us so far, but for a lot of AR, like it's it's you can really sense distance more than you can when you're looking at a 2D map where the sense of scale is 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 obviously um, is obviously different. So BPS helps to position. I mentioned that a bit earlier, but you can start to to use data that you had prior about um, the 3D environment and, and the camera can use that to, to work out exactly where you are to a pretty high degree of precision. And that can complement other positioning systems like Wi-Fi positioning systems, um, beacons, and, uh, and of course, GPS. So this was a, a test, you can look at this, it's um, on, on the Meta website, but this was in Philadelphia airport where they mapped it with uh, um, and obviously for the 3D scan and then wearing these glasses he was able to position and, and work out exactly where he was. Um, it's it's not, not something that you can use to navigate just yet using these, but it's, it's obviously testing to see what you could potentially do in the future. So VPS is a pretty essential input. And this is what's exciting, I think, in the open data community. Mapler is another tool to collect. VPS, the, the API is, is open. You can download the point clouds, play around with them, and try to recreate your own VPS. And this is in, uh, is this Graz? Yeah, uh, Graz, yeah. Yep, Graz with a um, pretty good quality 360 cam, similar lighting conditions. So the input was was was, um, was not too variable, which made it um, obviously a high quality output. It's not all like this, especially from like smartphones inside the windshield with flare, you get choppy, but you can do some pretty cool things. And so you can imagine how you could use this to locate where, where the user is in the future with, with AI devices. And all of this is to enable experiences like this. <coughs> Open map data for the next generation of maps, being able to see where is the nearest Vietnamese restaurant? Has a friend recommended this place? What's the wait time? Having all these like incredible experiences where you don't need to rely on, you can still use a smartphone, but you're more immersed in, in the world around you. Um, and then there's a million different things we haven't even thought of that the people using open data will be able to create. And that's the good thing about having a lot of this data in the open is that you can ensure that a greater diversity of use cases are enabled. So that's some of the stuff that our maps team is working on. And uh, there's plenty of us here if you're interested. So thank you for listening. Uh, if you're keen to hear more, please do come to our other sessions. We're at the Meta booth as well. Maps at Meta.com is where we talk about some of the stuff that we're doing publicly. We have Map with Rapid to talk about our editors for, for OpenStreetMap, Mapler to talk about the street level imagery service that I mentioned. So thanks for listening.